So welcome everyone to the webinar, Privately Protected Areas on the Move, part one of a three-part webinar series hosted on IUCN and WCPA's Vital Sites platform. Hello everyone, and thank you very much for, for joining us today. This is the first in a three-part series, and we hope that you will find it interesting and satisfying and join us for the other two, and we will provide links to registration for the other two sites um, later on. We were pleased to learn that this is one of the most popular of the presentations in the vital sites series that IUCN is having. And we think that you'll find that it's well worth your time and hope you, hopefully as exciting and inspiring as we would like it to be. So the, as we get started, I want to invite you to actively use the chat section uh, we have a series of presentations, most of which have been recorded in advance, but the, the, there will be opportunity to respond to questions later on. And the presenters, almost all of whom are present on this call, will be answering some of the questions in the chat that you, that you pose. So to begin, privately protected areas are dramatically underrepresented in national protected area systems and underreported internationally despite the fact that they are a rapidly growing manifestation of diverse conservation areas and interests. And fulfilling the ambitious targets uh, that we expect to be set later this year on area-based conservation, will definitely need to include uh, these private conservation initiatives and areas. This webinar series is based on a document, Guidelines for Privately Protected Areas, which was published as part of IUCN's series of guidelines for best practices in protected areas. The document of guidelines for PPAs is freely available on IUCN.org in English, French, and Spanish. We hope to publish it soon in Portuguese and Japanese, and there are additional languages that we are hoping are in the works. These guidelines were developed by the specialist group on privately protected areas and nature stewardship of IUCN's World Commission on Protected Areas. The group is working to elevate the recognition understanding and integrity of private conservation worldwide. The guidelines drew from wide experience and we had numerous contributors contribute and comment <clears throat> on the draft. The work is coordinated by the QLF Atlantic Center for the Environment under the auspices of IUCN. Our partner in this work is the International Academy for Nature Conservation of BFN, the German Nature Conservation Agency. BFN will host a training website soon, which will include a lot of additional information. So we look forward to that and hope that you will watch for that. So we begin this session uh, with a brief set of remarks by a Andrea Hoening of BFN's International Academy for Nature Conservation. We welcome you, Andrea, to give us some introductory remarks. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Kent. It is a great pleasure to me to welcome you to the opening of the virtual workshop series, Privately Protected Areas on the Move. My name is Andrea Höing. I'm a research assistant at the International Academy for Nature Conservation of the German Federal Agency for Nature Conservation, BFN. We have been delighted to see so many registrations from many different corners of the world that show the large interest in the topic. Privately Protected Areas on the Move is part of a series of trainings developed by the IUCN WCPA Specialist Group on Privately Protected Areas in collaboration with and support by the International Academy for Nature Conservation of the BFN. The Global Biodiversity Outlook, published in fall 2020 once more, shows the critical state of biodiversity worldwide. The previous goals of the international community to protect biodiversity and to use it sustainably and equitably have been clearly missed. Protected areas are one of the most important instruments to achieve nature conservation. With the expected more ambitious goals in regard to protected area coverage and the forthcoming global biodiversity framework, privately protected areas and other effective area-based conservation measures will become even more important especially as government budgets might not be sufficient to finance further government-run PAs. At the same time, the potential of privately protected areas to pull in new actors and allies into conservation is exceptional. All over the world, we see an increase in the number and extent of PPAs, also in Germany. 
Hence, BFN considered it as very important to provide assistance to all PPA stakeholders for a better governance and management of their sites. As Kent just mentioned, BFN supported the development of the best practice guidelines on PPAs and the design of trainings, which will be available online on the BFN website later this year. The material can be used for self-paced learning and for consultation. We are delighted to look back on a long-standing and close partnership between IUCN and the Academy. Within the framework of this close cooperation, many influential expert workshops around the topic of protected areas have been convened on film. The amazing natural environment on the Isle of Film seems to bring about a highly productive work atmosphere, strong bonds and unforgettable moments. No wonder that workshops results have found their way into international decision making and global guidance. To give only one example, in early 2020, together with the IUCN Global Protected Areas Program, we jointly organized a workshop that resulted in suggestions for measurable qualitative PA targets to inform the development of the new global biodiversity framework. We are more than happy to be able to work synergistically with IUCN to promote high standards and new concepts in PA governance and management and to reach out widely. The Academy has a strong focus on capacity development in its work. And in this regard, it helps to develop trainings and tools and encourage their application. Currently, we also develop training materials and organize online training events on OECMs. The materials will also be made available online soon. The training series uh, on privately protected areas shall provide all additional information needed to apply and promote the IUCN guidelines on PPAs. We hope the trainings encourage individuals or groups to establish, improve, and report PPAs to the World Database on Protected Areas. That would help us to get one step closer to reach IG Target 11. We particularly thank Brent Mitchell as chair and Sue Stolten as vice chair of the IUCN WCPA specialist group on privately protected areas for their great work in organizing this uh, Vital Sites PPA series together with their team. I now wish our virtual meeting every success. Thank you very much, Andrea. And again, we would like to reiterate our appreciation to BFN for all of the support that you've provided for this. And the dynamic use of the chat has already been exemplified by the fact that I have been corrected and not corrected, but added to and told that there's a Polish language version of the guidelines that are coming out soon. So it's really very exciting. So now we want to get to the core of our sessions. We have three presenters uh, who will cover the first three sections of the guidelines, each uh, giving presentations with a maximum of 15 minutes. For a number of reasons, uh, these presentations have been pre-recorded, though two of the three presenters are, are present with us today. During these talks, we invite you to use the chat function, as we've discussed, to put any questions that you have. And after the presentations, I will choose the informational questions to ask the presenters. And, uh, and, and after those informational questions, we'll turn to a set of three commentators who will speak on these three topics. And after those, we'll return to the more general questions in, a, in an open uh, question and answer session. Uh, I, if we don't get enough questions, I have some of my own I'll pose. And uh, we think that the thought 90 minutes will go rapidly and with great interest. So first then, in the first of these three recorded presentations, we have our, our leader, Brent Mitchell, um, who is in charge of this overall group and this effort who will talk about establishing privately protected areas. Brent is Senior Vice President of QLF, Atlantic Center for the Environment, and as I mentioned, Chair of the IUCN WCPA Specialist Group on Privately Protected Areas and Nature Stewardship, and in this regard, our boss, Brent. I'm Brent Mitchell. Chair of the Specialist Group on Privately Protected Areas and Nature Stewardship of the World Commission on Protected Areas. Here to talk about establishing PPAs. This is the first chapter on IUCN's guidelines on privately protected areas. These guidelines are just that, guidance, and they have been developed so as to be relevant all around the world. Therefore, they cannot be too specific 
This is not a detailed how-to manual. However, it is derived from experience around the world and offers principles that will guide people working in very different legal, economic, and social contexts. Many of you have, or will have, experience that can help improve this guidance over time. My personal experience began while working as a wildlife biologist with the oldest land trust or private land conservation organization in the United States. The trustees of reservations is as old as our national parks, but as in other countries since, recognition and support for private conservation came later than for government protected areas. That is certainly true at the global level as well, where we see scant attention to private conservation until quite recently. In 2014, our group inserted language on private protected areas into the Convention on Biological Diversity for the first time. And in 2016, we pushed through a resolution mandating that IUCN support PPAs and strongly encouraging state governments to do the same. The guidelines are built around a series of principles. The very first principle is that a privately protected area must be a protected area. That is, it must meet the IUCN definition of a protected area. And that is a clearly defined geographical space, recognized, dedicated, and managed through legal or other effective means to achieve the long-term conservation of nature with associated ecosystem services and cultural values. Therefore, a privately protected area is simply a protected area under private governance. This seems obvious conceptually, but in practice, there has often been a bias towards government protected areas with any other kind of governance considered in a different class. Now, this question of definition came into sharp focus and much discussion as IUCN and others grapple with the rather new term introduced under the Convention on Biological Diversity, that of other effective area-based conservation measures or OECMs. Adding acceptance of the definition at site level, PPAs should be officially recognized by a credible entity. That entity is often a government, but in some cases that is not currently possible or feasible. So the recognition can come from elsewhere and stand in for official recognition. The point is that some institution beyond the owner of the PPA should recognize its legitimacy. Accreditation programs can provide this second party recognition. In my country, in the United States, increasing numbers of land trusts, non-governmental PPA organizations, are becoming accredited for adherence to specific standards of behavior. IUCN's new Green List is another accreditation program, and I think we'll see more such efforts over time. Establishing a PPA should come with clear conservation objectives from the beginning. This seems obvious, but we see many areas where this is not the case. That is, the objective is vague, not well articulated, or responding to only one immediate threat. PPAs should complement areas protected by government or other actors like indigenous communities. Though private, management objectives should link to national priorities for conservation. In my home state of Massachusetts, the government provides some incentives for PPAs, including for land purchase, but the area must be in habitats prioritized by state scientists. Similarly, the European Union's Natura 2000 program has identified all priority nature areas, many of which are on private lands. Priorities can also include connectivity, and indeed PPAs can be particularly useful in filling gaps. Some countries have not had the capacity to fully elaborate priorities, in which case PPAs can follow international guidance from large NGOs and others. And all that being said, 
government priorities should not preclude PPAs in areas considered lower priority at a national level. There may be local or other reasons that a PPA makes sense. Like plants or animals, PPAs thrive in a supportive environment. Governments can, and in some countries do, play an important role by creating clear, supporting frameworks. I mentioned before that PPAs in my country are as old as our first national parks, but they really took off when new legislation enabled them. We have a whole chapter on incentives, including financial incentives, but in terms of establishing PPAs, there are other forms of support. International recognition can provide support, especially in areas where government support is weak or even antagonistic. And PPAs can benefit from peer support. It is especially important that pioneer PPAs establish trust in private approaches to make it easier for other areas to follow. I think this is true in Brazil where early efforts have led to thousands of PPAs. Now, there's no one right way to establish a PPA. There are lots of mechanisms that vary by need, context, and circumstance. A few examples. So-called full fee ownership, where a landowner fully controls the area and sets about to designate it fully to conservation. Surrendering some rights like mining or development while maintaining other uses, say sustainable forestry. The legal surrender we often call easements or conservation restrictions. A third party such as an NGO can purchase or lease rights or accept a covenant from a willing landowner. Sometimes businesses are set up to manage for conservation, but for a profit. Some game preserves come to mind, depending on how well they are at management for conservation. Companies with other business will sometimes set up PPAs for public benefit, either to improve their image or as a reclamation or offset. And private conservation can extend to marine areas, though some of the mechanisms are still being tested. One caution is that PPAs should, pri should use private means for conservation not as a means to other ends, especially to disenfranchise legitimate claims to land or resources. We don't know a lot of cases of abuse, but in places with unclear land tenure, the potential for abuse is great. And we often equate private governance with land ownership, but as some of my examples illustrate, that is not always the case. Private governance is really about who is ultimately making decisions about management and use. Thus, private conservation should be possible even in places where private land ownership is not. And we are seeing people explore the potential in seemingly unlikely places. Part of the definition of a protected area, and therefore a PPA, is to achieve the long-term conservation of nature. Thus, all PPAs should be established with a long-term strategy and sustainable financing. As difficult as it may seem at the time, establishing a PPA is often the easy bit. Maintaining it over the long term is more challenging, especially as we are all mortal and owners and managers will change. Structures must be in place to accommodate that fact. The nature of those structures will vary. We are working to provide examples and promote exchange of experience to help conservationists secure PPAs for the long term. And finally, though we are all mortal and will not be on this earth for the long term, at least individually, private conservation is a people business. It is driven by private initiative, means, and passion. Adhering to the principles can help see past immediate barriers and frustrations. We hope the guidance we collect and distribute 
will help you and others like you fulfill the potential of privately protected areas. Thank you. Thank you, Brent, very much. That was an excellent introduction and an inspiration. The second uh, presenter we have is Sue Stolten, who is a key member of the WCPA specialist group on private protected areas, and who was a leader on the assessment, which really got this, got much of the movement started uh, that we're reporting on today, as well as being a highly experienced protected area consultant with equilibrium research. Hi, I'm Sue Stolten. I'm part of the uh, specialist group on privately protected areas and nature stewardship of the World Commission on Protected Areas. And I helped coordinate the development of the best practices. I've been working on protected area governance and management issues for about 20 years um, as, small, as part of a small consultancy called um, Equilibrium Research. Um, so the management chapter of the best practices um, was a challenging one to put together. Uh, all protected area management is complex, uh, whatever the governance type, um, and it is really determined by a wide range of contextual issues, including the capacity of those managing the site, where the site is in the world, um, and the opportunities and challenges, challenges related to conservation management, as well as a whole range of external factors from legislation to the impacts of climate change and even pandemics. So this chapter really focuses on the basic elements of what we mean by good management for privately protected areas. Um, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel, um, so our starting place was to recommend a wide range of documents and training materials um, that are already developed by IUCN and WCPA, um, as well as by others. Um, so this document is one of a series within the best practice volume, volumes developed by WCPA, which you can find on the um, IUCN website. And there is also a really extensive um, online volume called Protected Area Governance and Management, um, which is also available in French and Spanish, like many of the other best practices um, and our guidelines, in fact. Um, and also, I wanted to draw attention to IUCN's programme on African Protected Areas and Conservation, PAPACO's uh, MOOCs. MOOCs stand for Massive Open Online Courses. Um, they have these on conservation and protected areas. Uh, open means they're available to anyone to take part in. Um, they're also available in both English and French. And the courses cover a really wide a range of issues around protected area management, ecological monitoring, law enforcement, species conservation, and many more things. So there's a lot of information out there before we already need to start looking at PPA issues specifically. So management um, is really a, a process of decision making. Um, it can lead to active management, such as a restoration program, um, managing visitors or monitoring specific species, or it might mean making the decision to do nothing at all, to let nature take its course. So rather than being about management action specifically, this chapter of the PPA guidelines gives some basic advice around that process of decision making and capacity building. Um, to manage and once management actions have been decided um, yeah, building capacity to manage. Um, we also talk uh, throughout about management systems. Um, of course many PPAs will have written plans developed um, through multiple processes but management planning doesn't have to be um, necessarily very complicated um, and we use the word system to imply any form of decision making and planning process. So our best practices are arranged around these overall principles um, and then a number of best practices. All of these best practices are rooted in experiences from PPAs around the world and many examples are given both in the chapters and at the end in a series of case studies in the guidelines. So our first principle um, is that current and potential PPAs um, should have a clear understanding of what is happening in and around the protected area before developing management activities. 
So this can mean obviously being aware of issues like national or regional legislation that can impact management. Um, but most importantly, it's about learning and sharing practices, particularly with similar properties, um, either in the same area or properties doing similar types of um, uh, objectives. The role of um, PPA networks is covered elsewhere in the guidelines and in another webinar in these series. Um, but it's really important, PPA networks are really vitally important um, in helping managers and, and owners do their jobs effectively and this kind of sharing of information. There's also, of course, um, ecological and social issues to consider <clears throat> when managing a site. It's kind of rather obvious to say incorporate conservation values <clears throat> and biodiversity status and trends into management plans and systems. Um, but protected areas, by definition, are about achieving the long term conservation of nature. So just managing, say, for one bird species <clears throat> and ignoring everything else is not the same as managing an area for nature as a whole. So at the very least, PPA should have basic maps of habitats, information on species occurrence, and an understanding of the connect connectivity with other natural and semi-natural habitats. So working and learning with others can save considerable time and effort um, and helping and help build local alliances when developing management activities. Um, here, um, we're not just talking about other PPAs and PPA networks, but also incorporating indigenous, local, traditional peoples and their knowledge. Um, and finally, under this first principle, um, it's very clear from PPA experiences around the world that good um, consultation with stakeholders helps support engagement um, and perhaps even can contribute to PPA management. And I'll talk um, a little bit more about the role of vet volunteers in management later in this presentation. So our second principle um, focuses on having defined um, objectives for what you're doing. As I noticed, noted at the start, management and management systems don't need to be overcomplicated, but it's important to think through what type of management the site needs and to record exactly what the PPA is trying to achieve. So our first best practice under this principle um, stresses the need to create clear, a clear strategy, thinking about the things like the overall PPA vision, mission, objectives and actions. Plans should then be based around activities needed to fill these objectives. Um, there is already a lot of guidance on action planning for conservation um, areas. So our guidelines um, really provide resources rather than prescriptions here. Um, but it's just important to remember when developing plans and actions that you will want to actually assess the progress of your actions. Um, one type of planning that was stressed by PPA managers and owners was the need to conduct a risk assessment and develop mitigation plans. So when a problem does arise, um, there is a plan ready um, to action and implement. I think this type of level of planning may seem bur burdensome, particularly for small PPAs with little management capacity, but really it's exactly those types of sites that um, can least cope when problems arise. I think the current pandemic pandemic is a is a case in point um, with many PPA struggling around the world um, as tourism and thus their dominant funding stream collapses, um, while others have been more resilient and able to fall back on contingency planning. So talking of funding, maybe again, talking of funding, um, the third principle um, is focused on understanding the full costs and benefits um, of the PPA and linking management activities to realistic budgets and where possible contributing benefits to the local community. Um, these benefits do not have, don't have to be financial. Um, they can often take the form of employment or capacity building or both. Um, the guidelines include a great example from South Africa where a tourism company has a concession to manage local community lands for conservation. After 30 years, the association, the associated lodge will pass back to the community who will in the meantime have been trained to operate it profitably. And of course we should never stop learning, um, a simple fact covered by the next principle. Um, 
that manage has to, management has to be adaptive. And a good example involves kind of learning, learning by doing. The guidelines provide examples of simple monitoring plans and how to develop self-assessment of management effectiveness and provide background information on things like IUCN's green list of protected and conserved areas. Um, which already includes some PPAs, and you can read about that in one of the case studies from Kenya. A good example of this adaptation um, is the PPA Association in Chile that adapted the management effectiveness tracking tool, the MET, um, both to assess candidate PPA sites um, and to um, inform site owners on what management actions they needed. Um, just to say that since these PPA guidelines were developed, um, a new version of the MET, MET4 has been developed and you can find that on the Protected Planet website. Um, and we also ran two training sessions on that tool within this vital site series. So as well as deciding on what to manage and how to assess your actions um, effectively, um, it's important to build a team around management capacity. Um, the key point here is that even without staff, PPAs can be effective. Some PPAs make working relationships with a range of organisations to carry out management activities, um, with some or passing management to other organisations altogether, while others, for example, link up with universities to carry out research and monitoring. Uh, another example from the PPA Association this time in Peru has a Donate Your Talent campaign, which links uh, professionals from different fields like economics, architecture, biology, tourism and such like um, to donate their time and knowledge to a PPA to help solve specific issues or management needs. And PPA, owner, PPA owners can share tasks and equipment between themselves to save re resources. Conservation is increasingly becoming about partnerships at all levels. Volunteers, um, of course, are a great resource for many protected areas. Um, in the UK, the RSPB um, has about 85% of the people that work for the organisation of volunteers, which represents something like a million working hours of volunteer time a year, which is amazing. Most organisations won't have quite that level um, of, of input, but in the guidelines, we include an amalgamation of good practices from running volunteer programmes from around the world um, and in brief um, these look at things like ensure that you're clear about what you're trying to do with volunteers show how the actions that they're doing is helping achieve the PPA objectives ensure PA staff PPA staff really understand um, the volunteers roles um, evaluate volunteer experiences, find out what people think about what they've been doing, obviously ensure volunteer safety and ensure legal compliance concerning um, any workers or working conditions. Those are just some basics. The final best practice um, is around communication. Um, oops. Uh, to put simply, um, the more we communicate the reasons for conservation and the actions that we do, the better results we'll have and the more support that we will get. And again, as with all the best practices and principles in, the, in the, um, this chapter, there is much more information in the chapter. Anyway, thank you um, for listening and um, for more information on privately protected areas, here is um, our task force website. Thanks very much, goodbye. Thank you, Sue. Um, if we are ready then for our final presentation. And we'll start my video, uh, which is uh, a presentation, a recorded presentation by Tracy Cumming Cherry from South Africa, who is a project leader of the UNDP Biofin, which is the Biodiversity Finance Initiative. And uh, Tracy was not able to join us because she's actively engaged in the discussions around the CBD at this time. Uh, but. We welcome questions for her presentation nonetheless, and the rest of us will try to answer them or pass them along to her. Hi, I'm Tracy Cumming, and I will be covering the topic of incentives as part of the IUCN guidelines for privately protected areas. I'll be taking us through seven principles and touch on numerous best practices for these principles. Before we delve into the principles and best practices, Let's start with what we mean when we say incentives. An incentive can be anything that provides motivation for a certain behavior. In the case of PPAs, 
Some examples of different types of incentives include recognition of landowners' efforts, supporting landowners' conservation ethic through education and awareness, management assistance, improved marketing opportunities and access to markets for green products, or financial incentives, including direct payments, tax breaks, and green subsidies. A lot of careful consideration should go into designing and implementing incentives. There are many things to consider from both the demand side, namely what incentives would appeal most to landowners, and the supply side, what incentives are affordable, practical, fair, and sustainable to offer, and work within the relevant legal and institutional framework. Incentives should be tied to achieving the desired conservation outcomes and should be clearly understood by all parties. They should be linked to the ongoing management and performance of the PPA and clear guidance should be provided on the eligibility for accessing incentives. Eligibility for incentives can be more nuanced than simply having PPA status. You can design degrees of incentives in Australia, for example, incentives are greater for areas of higher biodiversity importance. In South Africa, landowners are eligible for greater incentives when they commit to a longer duration of protection and have more land use restrictions on their land. It is useful to provide a mix of incentive options. Different landowners are motivated by different types of incentives based on their own needs and their own values. This leads me to the fourth best practice. The organization running a PPA program does not need to be providing all of the incentives themselves. Different types of incentives can come from a range of different sources. Partnerships with NGOs, government programs and corporates could offer incentives such as mentoring, recognition or training on specific land management issues like fire control. Address disincentives that landowners may face for establishing or managing PPAs. Try to understand the barriers that landowners face in creating and managing PPAs and see if these can be addressed by specific incentives. For example, a landowner may feel daunted by the prospect of actively managing a protected area and may be encouraged by hands-on management support and technical know-how. Alternatively, a landowner might be fine with that, but might feel that they lack the skills to access a market for green products or ecotourism and need support for their PPA in that way. Here again, support that is offered on this particular topic could be an incentive for that landowner. While incentives should be designed early on, it is best to continue to listen to feedback from landowners and be willing to adjust incentives or introduce new incentives accordingly. Principle two, incentives should encourage both PPA establishment as well as long-term governance and management. Creating incentives for establishing a PPA might require different incentives than those that help ensure long-term management. For example, landowners might be motivated by a conservation ethic to establish a PPA. However, they might be incentivized to remain committed in the long term by the relationships that they build with other PPA owners or the support that they are offered by conservation agencies. Whatever the type of incentives, incentives aimed at encouraging long term commitment must be sustainable over the long term. Perverse incentives are incentives that are developed with another goal in mind, such as stimulating agriculture or energy production, but have unintended negative consequences for, in our case, biodiversity. For example, there could be very real unintended economic penalties for converting land from primary production to conservation, such as increased land taxes for not developing the land, 
or a loss of agricultural subsidies when switching from more traditional commercial practices to greener practices. Incentives can be designed to counter this, such as the tax incentives available in South Africa, or the greening of the original subsidy, for example, the greening of agricultural subsidies to encourage better land stewardship within the agricultural space. In reality, the negative impact of perverse incentives on PPA landowners could be far greater than any positive incentives that can be offered and identifying and addressing perverse incentives or the elephant in the room may be fundamental to the long-term success of a PPA program. Non-financial incentives can be equally, if not more important than financial incentives to some landowners. Feeling part of a community, being recognized for benefiting biodiversity, and having strong relationships between landowners, NGOs, and government conservation authorities can be incredibly important motivators. If this type of incentive is provided, the right teams and resources need to be put in place in order to work well with landowners, to build positive relationships, and to sustain these relationships over time. Direct management and technical support to landowners can be a powerful motivator, combining the benefits of cost savings with creating a sense of belonging to a larger community and improving landowner know-how. This support can come from a range of actors, as I mentioned earlier. For example, in New Zealand, Covenanters Clubs offer peer mentoring and field trips, and members collectively work on each other's land. PPAs might have different income-generating opportunities than those of state-protected areas, for example, by appealing to a different ecotourism market. PPAs may also be in a better position to retain income than state-owned protected areas, where income such as gate fees is often channeled into general state funds. For PPAs with the potential to generate income, marketing assistance can be an effective incentive. PPAs that have income-earning operations can benefit from the added marketing value of formal recognition as a PPA, giving the land stronger green, green credentials. The long run, for example, is a global network of tourism businesses which support PPAs in a range of ways, including providing marketing support and recognition. Lastly, financial incentives remain strong motivators for both the establishment and long-term management of PPAs. These can take the form of direct payments, such as through payment of ecosystem service schemes, financial incentives, and leveraging matching funds. I'll go through a bit through best practice related to financial incentives. One, seek opportunities for leveraging additional funds, such as donor funds, to complement PPA investment. Land that has PPA status may help to provide credibility to projects that are seeking additional donors to invest in conservation. Direct payments can be used to compensate landowners for actual costs or for opportunity costs. Some good examples are payments for ecosystem services and purchases of conservation easements. In the USA, for example, the Nature Conservancy occasionally purchase, purchases conservation easements when the landowner cannot benefit from the related tax rates and the land is considered to be of high biodiversity priority. 3. Financial incentives should encourage additionality. Increased financial resources could be channeled to the PPA if it provides ecosystem services beyond biodiversity conservation, such as climate change adaptation and mitigation, or catchment management of an important water supply. If this is a possibility, the initial PPA agreement or covenant must be designed to allow for these multiple funding streams. 
For example, in New Zealand, landowners with covenants on their land are able to benefit directly from carbon trading schemes related to regenerating forests, and in some catchments can also benefit from nutrient trading schemes to protect freshwater quality of lakes and rivers. Fiscal incentives should be developed cooperatively between government finance departments, other relevant government agencies, NGOs and landowners to ensure that the incentives fit appropriately into fiscal regulations and can be effectively implemented and managed, as well as make sense for the types of landowners that have PPAs. Fiscal incentives should be designed to be applicable to the highest number of PPAs. For example, designing tax incentives that may only be realized by a few high net worth individuals and not other landowners with similar biodiversity importance can be problematic. In these cases, other incentives need to be made available. I hope you found this information useful. All of us are driven by a complex array of incentives and disincentives. I bet you can point to your own motivating reasons for listening to this webinar. Understanding what really motivates landowners and finding a way to tap into and support that motivation is a key element to effective and sustainable protected areas. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. So uh, now we have a few minutes to deal with questions that have come in that are informational in nature. And we don't have Tracy, so we're going to ask uh, Brent and Sue to channel her. So the first question that has come in is, how, how many privately protected areas are there in the world? Well, uh, the short answer is we don't know. Um, <laughs> Um, we wish we did, um, but uh, the, the mechanism for counting um, privately protected areas is the same as for all protected areas. The, the World Database on Protected Areas, which is managed by the, um, um, the World Conservation Monitoring Center uh, in the UK. And historically, all of the data for protected areas has been provided by government agencies. Um, and this, this tracks the you know, historical um, sort of bias towards government protection for conservation. And so the data really hasn't caught up. Of course, there's an issue if, if a government doesn't um, recognize privately protected areas, they're not going to report any data on them uh, up to the WCMC. Um, and there are also capacity issues in terms of uh, tracking and monitoring. But we do know that there are many countries that have, uh, have private databases. Um, Brazil is a great example, um, which are not yet integrated up into uh, the world uh, uh, database. Now, the WCMC is, is working on that, and they're providing mechanisms where non-governmental organizations uh, can provide um, data. And, uh, but that's still really getting off the ground. And if, if you're interested in this topic, I, I would encourage you to join our third session uh, where we have, a, we have a whole chapter on reporting of privately protected areas, and it'll deal with uh, some of these issues and, and how um, there are new mechanisms coming on to address it, uh, as well as uh, how to differentiate um, between privately protected areas and uh, OECMs or other effective area-based conservation measures on private land, um, which is something we've worked very hard to keep in a, a distinction on. So, oh, all right. um, Mm -hmm. Brent, I think, well, the, the problem with this question is that it's a huge question <laughs> that actually wraps the whole thing in. And so I think we'll uh, just, there was a very particular question, and I think you've probably already answered it, but just very briefly, how many PPAs are there in the Middle East and are they managed effectively? The kind of question you might expect to be asked. Yeah. Why can't we answer that? 
and again, we don't know. And um, uh, what we we have been there's been so much work to do on a qualitative description of privately protected areas. That's where we've been focused and others. Um, there's a big job yet to do on the quantitative front, and I would love to be able to answer <laughs> those questions. And hopefully we will day, one day soon. And uh, hopefully we can work with some of you folks who have posed those questions uh, to begin to bring that data uh, into the world database. Okay, I think most of the rest of the questions we're going to hold until the more general session. Sue, did you have any comments you wanted to make to add or any of the things you've seen in the chat that you'd like to comment on now? No, only to say that at the moment on the WDPA, there's about 17,000 um, roughly PPAs, but I'm sure that's not the right number as yet. Yeah, so yeah, what you get, get to see, those of you in the audience, is the kind of challenges that we face, um, and particularly working through the world uh, database of protected areas, the difficulties of reporting up. So hopefully it's a work in progress and definitely things have improved since the last World Parks Congress. So Brent and Sue, thank you very much. We'd like to transition now to the set of comments. If uh, Rashir, if we could get Chadni, Christina and Delphine on screen and take Brent and Sue off. Um, yes. All right, then what we, what we are doing now uh, is having these set of three fine people who are going to offer very brief comments on the presentations that have been made to give you a little more richness and a little bit of particularity to some of the more general statements that we have provided. We will then have everybody available and we will deal with some of the broader questions that have been raised in the chat section. So first we have Chadni Navalka, who will respond to the Establishing PPA's uh, presentation. Uh, Chadni is Program Manager for the International Land Conservation Network, which is a program of the Lincoln Institute for Land Policy. Please go ahead. Thanks, Kent, and thank you for the opportunity to share reflections on Brent's overview of the principles and best practices for establishing privately protected areas. The establishment of a PPA can be one of the most powerful forms of direct voluntary action for the conservation and stewardship of nature. Um, that provides benefits, multiple benefits for landowners and communities. And in, in many cases, PPAs are the outcomes of landowners and land users expressing their care for the land, their relationship to land and place, cultural, religious, or spiritual values for their contribution to livelihood or for scientific benefits. And while it's less true in some places than in others, I think that part of the importance of sharing these guidelines, which as Brent noted, have been developed from decades of experience in countries from Australia to Peru and beyond, really stems from the complexity of private land ownership and management and its different histories and countries around the world. And so with that in mind, as I listened to the presentation, within that first step of establishing a PPA, it's also the first opportunity to build trust across all stakeholders in private approaches to conservation and stewardship for direct or indirect public benefits using this guidance. And I also wanted to bring up the point that like other types of protected areas, PPAs, while they must have a primary conservation objective, may also be, and I think increasingly are, set up with compatible social and economic objectives. They can be established in all types of areas from rural to urban to exurban areas. And the mechanisms used in their establishment should ideally be appropriate for the ecosystems and the social context. For example, full fee ownership, which is one of the mechanisms mentioned by Brent to establish a PPA, may be more appropriate when a property or landscape includes sensitive ecological or natural resources or where public use is a significant objective. But uh, in other cases, an easement or a covenant may be more appropriate where conservation objectives include nature-friendly productive use. Um, in urban areas, as another example in the US, conservation developments which combine uh, residential construction and set-asides for conservation may be used to meet housing and nature conservation goals in urban or suburban areas. And beyond these 
pretty common mechanisms in certain countries are an array of tools that can be used in very different country contexts to establish PPAs that meet the multiple, I would say, present and future needs of landowners and land users and contribute uh, to their long-term relevance and hopefully their durability. And then lastly, I really liked and would like to amplify the point that Brent made in his presentation on how pioneer individuals or groups can play that role of establishing trust and providing peer support to grow a movement. Um, an example that comes to my mind is, is, as Sue also had an example from Chile, but in Chile with what an organization called Fundación Tierra Austral is doing, it's Chile's first land trust, and they are building interest and support for conservation in an important habitat type, which is largely under private ownership in Northern Chile. And although enabling legislation for the establishment of PPAs in Chile was passed in 2016, um, few landowners or groups utilized that tool either because they weren't aware of it, didn't trust it, or didn't see the benefits of doing so. And Fundación Tierra Austral is raising awareness about the tool and partnering with landowners to establish PPAs using it following best practices. And by developing those private, those pilot projects, um, they are kind of developing bl blueprints that can be used throughout Chile and in other civil code countries. So while that model might not be a blueprint for everybody, I think it's important to highlight what a small and dedicated group of peers can achieve through collaboration and partnership across sectors to build public trust uh, in and support for establishing PPAs, which is a, a really important component. Um, and I think as this guideline session shows, while there's no how-to guide, there is an increasingly connected and growing community of practice to tap into to support and inform that work. Um, and and I, you know, I think that that, that is one of the, the most important uh, outcomes of of groups like the PPA Specialist Group and others. So thank you again for the opportunity to comment and Kent, I'll hand it back over to you. Excellent, thank you, Jadnia. So uh, next, the second of the commentators is Christine Cuiabalia, who is the manager of SESC Pantanal, which is the largest PPA in Brazil. Christina, please go ahead. Hi everyone, thank you, Kent. Um, it's a, very, it's a pleasure to be here with you. And thank you for inviting us to, to talk in this so important event to, to share and to learn about the PPS in the world and with another experience. So congratulations for the event, it's so important. So I am Cristina Cuiabalha. I am a biologist and I live in Brazil and I work at Sesc Pantanal. And Sesc Pantanal is a no-profit institution here, and we are developing uh, experience with conservation here in Pantanal. Pantanal is a very large wetland uh, in the center of the, in Brazil. And well, Sue talked it, uh, the golden rules of the, the, the managing of the PPA, and we highlight I think I first point because it's important uh, to have a clear understanding of what is happening all the sides of the PPA, around the PPA, and that, that reflect directly in, inside of the area. So it says Pantanal uh, Reserve is the largest PPA in Brazil, covering an area of about 1,000 square kilometers. Uh, is like is the same size of Hong Kong, for example. <laughs> it's a big area. Um, in, it is a Hamsar site too, and Corazon of the Pantanal Biosphere Reserve. And but the challenges go beyond of the size of the reserve, and there is a very complex context around the reserve. Um, many types of the, the, the people, farmers, indigenous people, um, traditional communities, and uh, it's a very, very, um, a really dynamic context to, is part of our management here. And the threat, the, the threats is part of this management too, and the, the more important for us is the predatory fishing, hunting, drug trafficking and 
forest fires. And on the last year, 93% uh, of the reserve burned and all the fires were caused by human. And 30% of the Pantanal, or Pantanal burned too. So this is a big area, is the same size of the Switzerland, for example. Can you imagine it? the Switzerland burned? So is this is the, the size of the, the fires in Pantanal last year. So we have a good team here in the reserve and we have a good infrastructure to, to control the fire and in 2020 uh, because this infrastructure, uh, many animals survived in the reserve because the fire was controlled inside of the reserve. And, but the fire in other areas, public unities or farms on other areas in Pantanal burned so fast and the animals died, a lot of animals died and we uh, burned too. But in the reserve, uh, many survived, many, many animals burned too, but uh, I'm, I, it's a good text of the animals survived. Moreover, um, we can count uh, on the support of the researchers, uh, part, uh, a good part of the communities around the, the reserve and some external partnership, uh, no governing, governmental Organize, organization and help us a lot of in this 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 time because I'm I'm sure this makes a difference because uh, is a very very complex and dynamic context and we need to work together. I think the way is the collaborative process in, in the management of this this area and DPAs in general. And despite the challenges, because uh, uh, we need reconciling the such different goals uh, around these these areas, and but the way is work together. So, thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Christina. And uh, the Pantanal is one of the world's most wonderful places. So good for you and your work. Uh, so the third of our uh, commentators is Delphine Mallaret King who's director of The Long Run, which is a global community of exceptional tourism destinations committed to a sustainable future. And if you were not able to travel and are looking forward to travel, I suggest a quick look at uh, Delphine's website and you can dream forever about wonderful places to go. So Delphine, please. Thank you, Kent. Thank you. Uh, really glad to be here. And it's very exciting to finally share the guidelines. Um, so I will be responding on Tracy's, uh, you know, provide comments on, on Tracy's presentation. Um, and just sorry, but first, if you're dreaming of traveling, I, one of our founding members uh, is located in the Pantanal and I think works quite closely with Christina to start there is quite, is quite incredible. Um, yeah, so as you can imagine, I'm gonna I'm gonna raise the flag of tourism here. Uh, one, that, you know, what I wanted to augment and highlight is really, although a lot of landowners are able uh, to to create privately protected areas uh, on the basis of a social entrepreneurship, um, many can't. And uh, I, I just wanted to highlight how income generation can be an important incentive to develop and maintain protected areas. And uh, especially where other, other land use are competing economically. The opportunity to generate income through tourism has represented a huge driver to extend uh, protected areas in, in many landscapes, including uh, the Pantanal. Uh, but also, um, I just wanted to, to, to share the example of Amara in Kenya, of the Maasai Mara, where tourism has enabled families to earn an income, earn an income and actually it has prevented land fragmentation. Uh, so families have brought their land together and, um, and work with tourism enterprise 
they get land rent, and that forms a huge, um, a huge component of livelihoods to, uh, to, to really secure that land, to secure migration corridors, um, and and biodiversity in the Mara. So I just think that it's interest, it, it's important to, to raise the fact that any policies that encourage tourism or other conservation compatible land use will help the expansion of, of habitat under protection and, and help the movement of privately protected areas. As we've seen though, tourism is, you know, not the, not, not the, the um, uh, secure vehicle that we imagine it would be. So I think for resilience, uh, diverse income streams are always always important to 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 be there. Uh, so that was my point. I think just not to undermine the importance of um, financial incentives. Okay, Delphine, is that you done? I am. Sure. Didn't want to cut you off. Okay. Excellent. Thank you very much. So, Chair, if, if we could have um, everybody up, everybody up and live. Sure thing. That, that would be great. And you, those of you following in the Q&A and the chat will have seen a quite active set of comments and responses. I'm going to, to try to pick out the questions that I think probably are of most interest to most folks. Um, but it would ask the, those of the rest of you up on the screen with me to, to identify other things that um, you thought were important. And we've provided, we've tried to provide a lot of answers to very precise particular questions like, is there a recording um, in, the, in the chat box? So you'll, we won't deal with those questions, but you'll be able to find the answers there as long, along with a set of, uh, of, of sites for people who are seeking further information. So I, let's start with uh, one of the biggest questions I think that is of concern to people, which is whether or not conservation easements can provide a long-term certainty that privately protected areas will continue to uh, conserve in the long run. So I, floor is open, but Brent, you might start us off on that. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And uh, first of all, I'm not a lawyer, but... Uh... From what I know, um, it, again, it's not an easy one to answer. Uh, Stephen, in your question, you recognize that there's considerable variation. So, um, in in my view, um, you know, legal certainty is an oxymoron. Um, I mean, in the United States, our laws uh, around conservation easements are are very very strong. Um, and they should provide um, protection in perpetuity. Um, however, you know, laws are created by people and what people make, people can undo. Um, so uh, there, there's never absolute certainty. Um, but uh, a lot of people have worked very hard to um, make the protections as, as secure as possible. Um, and uh, also beefing up or establishing capacity, both in terms of funding and legal expertise uh, to defend easements uh, going forward, because we, we will see challenges. Um, one, as the number of easements uh, grows and continues to grow, and with new targets being set, we can anticipate growth in the area. But also, um, you know, to be honest, some of the some of the early easements were not particularly well uh, constructed and, and will, be, when, will be challenged. And of course, if some go down, then it, uh, it begins to throw suspicion on the entire system. So um, other than that, um, I would point you to our second uh, session in this series, uh, which will deal specifically with the question of permanence um, or durability, as some people prefer. Uh, and that's, uh, uh, again, on the 16th of June. I uh, hope you can all tune in for that as well. Thank you, Brent. And I would just add for my own that it's important to ask the, the comparator question. And we've learned and to our sorrow through the PADDD program that even federally, nationally declared protected areas are lost and downgraded and cut off. So 
it's a general problem as well as a problem specifically for PPAs. Um, yes, so, I might add um, a further point is um, one thing I've been thinking about recently is um, layering on protections, not, not depending on a single one, um, but finding other ways to, uh, to provide that security and not, uh, not putting all your eggs in one basket, particularly in areas where perhaps the legal framework is not as secure as it might be. Thank you. Let's turn to Delphine. There's a question here about income generated by PPAs in a, as, a, as a general question. And certainly that's something that's a part of what you're doing. So let's start with you in a response. What's the question? The question is, what, what uh, experience is there with generating income through activities on privately protected areas? Um, well, there's a lot of experience in terms of, well, in, in the long run, for example, you can, you have visitors fees, um, you can uh, have guests for the days or stay at night, some of the members charge conservation fees, for example, that go directly in the, in the uh, management of the PPA. Um, I think that's the most common common form of generating income. Um, the you know a PPA is not in isolation, so it's also within a it's, it's within a landscape and within a social network. So a lot of our members um, generate income through their just tourism operation, um, spend their profit uh, on on different uh, different projects, or again raise. A specific, a specific part of the bed night um, is dedicated to to the conservation and community work that our members are doing. Thank you. Would would uh, I'm going to hold the carbon question for for next? But does anybody else want to contribute on this income generated by PPAs? All right. Then let's turn to the carbon question. Someone wants is particularly interested in the role of carbon sequestration as a financial mechanism and incentive for creation of privately protected areas. Is this something that is within the experience of any of you? Um, yes, so go ahead. Unfortunately, Tracy isn't here, who would be our yes. go-to person, <laughs> but Sue, Sue. So I was gonna say, not, not specifically, but um, one um, thing maybe to draw people's attention to is that um, we've been, and that's um, Equilibrium Research, my partner and I have been doing a project for the CBD recently on looking at um, financial incentives about local money made for local protected areas, both privately protected areas and others. Um, and certainly there, that's a document that's about to be launched any day now, but there are some examples in there from a couple of um, PPAs in Australia who have used carbon funding linked to fire management. Um, and I don't know um, which session James is on in our um, series of these vital sites, but um, session Second two, one. thanks Brent. Um, that, that's certainly something that he's been involved in a lot. So maybe something to come back to on that session, but um, carbon, I mean, the other thing to say is that it, it, it's, it's complicated. It's a complicated business getting into carbon. There are opportunities um, there are various kind of little guidelines around there and some ex some successful examples, often in corridors in between protected areas, but it, it, it's not a it's not a panacea. It's not it's not an easy thing to get into, but um, it's it's a possible opportunity. Um, but it's something that, you know, maybe we can look into or send some more details out when we've got some um, to anybody who wants to know that about that specifically. Thank you, Sue. Uh, so I'd like to then turn to a set of, there's a whole set of questions about the, the databases, the national databases and integration um, and with the world database. And that's not something that we're going to cover on, on this session. Uh, there, is a, there are a set of very particular legal and procedural questions that are concerned with that, that are that are probably best, Brent, when, what would be the best session for, for that to be dealt with? Uh, we'll have Heather Bingy, Bingham um, addressing that on the third session. 
So she is the grand wizard of privately protected area databases. And, uh, and so that the, the, the set of questions here that concern that we really would hope that you would return and talk to Heather in particular about, about those. Um, so Sue, back to you, there are some questions about the, the effectiveness, management effectiveness, and whether they've been applied to PPAs and whether PPAs are different than other kinds of protected areas in that regard. And what does that mean in relationship to the green list? Would you realize those are topics on which you have spent an enormous amount of time, but perhaps you could give us some short responses and send people some where to, where to look for more information, please. Absolutely. Um, I will put some links up in a minute to the, the vital sites uh, webinars on the Met um, and also where to get more information. Um, I would say that you can definitely use the, the Met, which is the Management Affection of Traffic Tracking Tool in any governance type. Um, a new version of the Met has just been developed, Met 4. Um, it basically covers the main areas of management that you need to do to manage for conservation, whether you're a privately protected area or an ICCA or, or a government managed protected area. There has been, I think it was in South Africa that, that did a specific um, version of the Met for uh, PPAs. Um, and I think there's some details about that somewhere. I could see if I can dig out, but I would say, have a look at the Met. We also always encourage um, adapting the Met to your specific needs. Um, there was also a linked question about the green list and the green list has indeed been used in privately protected areas already um, in our guidelines as a case study from Kenya, which is from a privately protected area that has been green listed. And there's, I think, at least a couple in Kenya that have been green listed. I'm a little bit out of date whether there's any more, but there's, again, it's it's not something that's governance type specific. It's a system that can be used. and. I would say I'm sort of quite passionate, really, that quite a lot of PPAs do get greenlisted because I think that we have, as a community, a PPA community, um, a lot of lessons to, to show to the world of protected areas, which tend to be dominated by government um, managed protected areas. We have an awful lot of good, good experiences to show to people. Um, anyway, I will put more details um, in the chat box about the Met in a second. Thank you. Uh, I note that Delphine is, has added some detail in the chat box about the carbon sequestration question. Is there anything you wanted to say, Delphine, or have you covered that in there? No, I've covered that. There's a lot of hurdles that makes the, the model just not work for most uh, privately protected area on the basis of scale. Okay, thank you. So I'd like to, to take up two of the issues that have occurred in a set of questions, and they're are related in the nature of the overarching question, which is what is the relevance and experience of PPAs first for areas that are basically community owned, community managed lands. So let's talk about that one first. And the second one um, has to do with marine areas and the experience with that. So taking the community managed areas, something that, that Holly has commented on, asked several questions, experiences, from any of you, Chadni, if you guys work with those at all? Yeah, it's a great question. And it depends on country context. For example, in Peru, the definition of private land conservation also includes community conservation. And so it, it can depend on, on how countries and their institutional and legal frameworks deal with the question of what does private mean? And that definition can be quite expansive at times which is why in the guidelines we see that um, when we're talking about privately protected areas, we can be talking about individuals, communities, civil society groups or NGOs and for-profit organizations. Okay, thank you. Anybody else want to talk about that? Christina, anything about uh, indigenous lands in Brazil? That's an entirely separate category, but do you work with any of the community owned and managed lands around your reserve? Yeah, so in Brazil, it's so common uh, inside of the conservation units is the name of the uh, parks and protected areas in Brazil and the private reserves only a category of this 
conservation unit is, is so common in this area, protected areas in Brazil. Uh, we have different groups um, around and inside some cases, and indigenous groups, uh, traditional communities like this in, in around the reserve. We have a very, very traditional communities around the reserve and is a community so important to, and we work together because our employers, uh, the employees of the reserve live in the, these communities and we have a good, good relationship with them. Um, but, uh, and the indigenous too. And, but it's different the way of they use the fire, for example, in this, these groups. The indigenous uh, use the fire, the traditional use to, to clean, to prepare the land to, to, to plant or to your production, sustainable production there. And, but is a fire with control because they use a traditional knowledge to, to do this. But the, the, um, the big problem for us is uh, new people, new groups coming and buying the, 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 the farms and clean the farms and uses the fire uh, without control. And all the fires that uh, affected the reserve the last year, uh, the origin was in all the side of the reserve, but not of the indigenous people or the traditional people, only the, the others um, uh, farms, basically. So, but uh, I think it's a natural challenge to, for us in Brazil, yeah. in, in special, because uh, is a country with a very, very rich culture in these groups and many different cultures. And it, we need work with this, with this difference and um, try uh, conciliating the, this, these goals and the interest to, in the managing their land. Good, thank you very much. Um, then the marine side. Uh, there have been some examples that have been cited in the chat uh, box, uh, particularly this one from Kenya, but there are other areas. So the, the, the general question is, so what's up with the marine area in which in where it's where tenure is less of a clear uh, issue and and how do we think about that and what's the status and Brent, you want to get us started with that? Yeah, I mean, there. Um... There have been numerous attempts to um, to to struggle with the uh, the whole tenure issue. Um, you know, it, uh, I guess part of it comes down to the fact that um, privately protected areas governance doesn't entirely equate to ownership. So um, it's really about who is making the major decisions. Uh, over management of the area, and often that is derived from ownership of the land, from the land tenure. It doesn't have to be conceptually. Um, so, you know, and, and it's particularly examples where it's a marine environment, but there, there is uh, emergent um, land uh, within the area. Um, then you have the marine area that's sort of associated with the land that becomes a little easier. Uh, so, um, it is possible conceptually, and so um, what you really have to do is step away from ownership and really talk about governance, which ultimately is, is control of management decisions. So if a private organization or individual has that management control, then it is by governance a privately protected area. I hope that makes sense. Thank you. Anybody else before I turn to Andrea? Yes, Stephanie. Yeah, so again, I think in our membership, we have several examples of civil, you know, I see civil is here with us. Uh, civil um, was, was the founder of the first, I think, privately marine protected area in Chumbi in Zanzibar. And I think more than in any, uh, in any um, context, Marine, you know, creating privately managed uh, 
privately go governed protected areas is rest on stakeholder consultation, stakeholder involvement. It's the big co uh, consensus building. Um, there's examples of privately uh, managed protected areas in Mozambique, I think, where in Indonesia, where the government has is allowing now um, privately uh, managed marine protected areas. Um, we also have an example in, in, in Indonesia, Misu, and it's a privately, it's, it's more of a private community partnership. So I think it's just bringing that um, co-governance together in a system that works uh, for management. Excellent, thank you. So we're down to the last couple of minutes uh, of our time. And so if I could, I'm gonna see whether Andrea has a few comments to make in closing out and um, maybe in particular why BFN has chosen to this PPA area for your support. And then we'll ask Brent to take us out, please. Uh, thank you, Kent. Yes, uh, BFN is still convinced that uh, yeah, protected areas are one of the most important instruments for nature conservation. And um, so, yeah, of course, so privately protected areas and OECMs become more and more important to um, reach the IG goals. And uh, therefore, yeah, we really strongly recommend the soon, hopefully, <laughs> um, the website uh, online where we uh, put all the training materials on both, like on PPAs and on the OECMs. Um, yeah, and I think you can already check it out for OECMs next month. And uh, we are very glad that uh, we have the chance here with the vital sites events to yeah to push this forward. Thank you very much again. Thank you. All right. Well, I think addressing a lot of the questions about um, supporting privately protected areas and uh, incentives for them. You know, one thing we learned from COVID is that um, we can't depend on protected areas to pay for themselves entirely. Uh, it just doesn't mm -hmm. work. Uh, there has to be public commitment, no matter what the governance is. And as we, um, as we see that there seems to be growing appetite in the, uh, uh, among governments to um, protect for climate change, for biodiversity, now for securing public health, um, that should uh, lead to greater public commitment for, for protecting nature. Um, and that's, you know, as we see the, the targets uh, ratchet up um, in, for 2030 and probably 2050, that's gonna include indigenous and conserved areas. It's gonna uh, include government protected areas, OECMs and private areas. Um, so it all argues that, um, you know, even climate commitments um, should make a connection um, to privately protected areas and the other govern governance types. So I think we're, you know, we're going to be seeing, we hope, a different environment. Uh, and so it's time to gear up the mechanisms for making things, these things happen um, across the governance spectrum. And I hope we'll all participate in that in some way. Thank you, Brent. Uh, thank you to all of the presenters. Uh, for those of you who attended, we appreciate your interest, your support, and of course, also the work that you're all doing in these numerous places around the world. We invite you to attend the next two events where some of the questions that have been raised will be dealt with in greater detail. And the you can sign up at the same Eventbrite site as brought you to us this time. So thank you for attending. Thank you for your work. And may you and your families be healthy. And we look forward to seeing you. Bye-bye.